Thank you for joining the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky's Health for a Change webinar, LGBTQ Literacy and Health Advocacy. I am Chloe Atwater, a policy associate at the Foundation. Joining us today is Senator Karen Berg, MD, who represents Kentucky's 26th district, which covers part of Jefferson County, Lily Glover, a pastor, theologian, and activist, Alexander Griggs, a marriage and family therapist, and Mike Sladen, the executive director of Louisville Pride, as well as a valued member of the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky Community Advisory Council. At the end of today's webinar, we hope to leave you all with more knowledge about the efforts to ban conversion therapy in the Commonwealth, a better understanding about the issues uh, and barriers facing transgender Kentuckians when finding and receiving health care, and some new skills for navigating conversations about gender. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. We've enabled the live transcript feature on this webinar. You can control whether you see the closed captioning by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen. We also invite any questions you may have, just type them into the chat box or the Q&A function and we'll address them during the Q&A portion of the program. But first, a little bit about us. The Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization focused on healthcare access, tobacco use reduction, obesity and diabetes mitigation and prevention, and children's health, specifically preventing and mitigating adverse childhood experiences. Much of what we do is in the policy realm, whether on the state level, local level, or even school or organizational level. We have a lot to get to today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our first panelist. Senator Karen Berg has served in the Kentucky Senate since 2020. During the most recent legislative session, Senator Berg was a co-sponsor on the Senate bill to ban conversion therapy in the state. She is here to talk to us about what happened with those bills and why this is an important issue to take on from the perspective of a legislator, a physician, and the parent of a trans kid. Senator Berg, take it away. Good morning. Thank you all for asking me to be here. Um, the bill, the commercial therapy bill in um, the Kentucky State House was originally sponsored by Alice Orgy Kerr. She is a Republican from Fayette County. She is um, retiring. She has been a senator for, oh my God, she's one of the, the longest serving. Um, but due to ill health, she is leaving. This conversion therapy bill is her bill. The reason, the way she came around to being the person to sponsor this bill is that she has a child who is openly gay and is now willing to acknowledge that and talk about that in the state house. Before I was elected, there was actually an interim committee meeting on this bill. There was some traction. There was some hope that this bill could actually get um, a, a hearing and maybe even pass. Uh, with Alice leaving, that, that hope is dimming um, because we had bipartisan sponsorship. We had a Republican who was actually willing to bring that bill forward. But um, I told her, and one of the reasons I co-sponsored this is that, that I would be refiling this bill and bringing it forward um, in her absence. So basically what, what conversion therapy is, um, um, I mean, for not wanting to be indiscreet, it's basically a, 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 an, an effort to play the, the gay out of you. I mean, through, it's an assumption that being gay is a mental illness and that with enough work and enough effort and enough devotion to God, um, you can correct that, you can fix that. And the problem with conversion therapy um, is that it increases suicidality. I mean, that's basically the biggest, biggest, biggest problem is that people are born gay, people, it is not a mental illness. And to try to, to try to, make somebody change their core being like that only increases their disaffectedness with society, their, their sense that they do not belong, that they cannot belong and they will never belong. And statistically, 
increases suicidality tremendously. It is not a rec recommended by any of the um, sanctioned medical organizations in the country, not a one of them. Um, and there are some states that have bills banning it. We will keep working towards making Kentucky one of those. And um, unless somebody has questions, I'll yield the floor. Thank you, Senator Berg. Now we are going to hear from some people about their experiences finding and receiving adequate care uh, in Kentucky. Alexander, if you can start us off. Yes, sure. Um, so a little bit about my background. I just had top surgery. I'm a transmasculine man um, and I've had to fight for about eight years in order to get it. Um, I had what I hoped would be top surgery eight years ago here in Kentucky and ended up with a bigoted surgeon that in, agreed to do top surgery and then performed a routine reduction. And then afterward told me that no breasts would have looked dumb. Um, I know that people generally don't think that those things, I know there's been a lot of push for, you know, religious freedom um, and things unlike that in determining who public officials and public service people like in medicine and in therapy and um, things like that can make the discrimination of whether or not who they want to provide services for, but um, with this newfound sense of freedom and ability to gain access to what I need to feel comfortable in my body, I feel a heavy sense of responsibility to share that um, this is the first time in my life that I haven't experienced, that, that I haven't experienced any kind of suicidality. And, that gender affirmation surgeries, access to transition, things that are very difficult to get here in Kentucky can literally be life and death for our community. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and let someone else go. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, Lily, would you like to say a few words? Hi, I'm sorry for being a few minutes behind. Could you repeat the topic or the question for the opening here? Yeah, sure. Um, if you could just speak to your experience navigating, receiving uh, adequate um, and affirming health care in Kentucky, um, you can say as much or as, as little as you want about it, um, whether that's gender affirming care or just going to a doctor and, and navigating um, the just being trans in Kentucky in healthcare. Sure. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us here too. Um, well, so so my I, I, my journey actually started uh, in in the state of Tennessee, uh, and I relocated to Kentucky about it's been about seven or eight years now. So whenever I first started looking for care, I was in high school. And there really weren't many options at the time. Um, this was somewhere around 2004, 2005. Uh, and that led to a lot, of, um, a, a lot of problems. So not having access to care really, um, it, my, my dysphoria was very debilitating. For some trans people, that's, that's true. And for some people, it's not. But for me, it was, it was very debilitating and it affected every aspect of my life. Um, it was a struggle. I often got in these um, referral circles where I would go and try and find a therapist um, to be able to gain access to a doctor. And the therapist would meet with me for three or four sessions and then say, uh, but I wish I could help, but I can't. So let me refer you to somebody who can. And they would refer me to someone and I would go see them for three or four sessions. And they would say something very similar, you know, I wish I could help, but I can, I just don't have the tools for this. And 
they would refer me to someone else and eventually I would get kind of referred back around in the circle. Um, so without any kind of therapist referral, doctors wouldn't see me. Uh, most doctor's offices would turn me away. Uh, and sometime around 2009, 2010, somewhere around there, in informed consent models became a little bit more popular. So I made an appointment about three and a half, four hours away from my um, residence at the time. And it was probably two or three months out, but the day came around and I told the doctor that I just needed a primary care doctor because most of the time whenever I called an office and said I was a trans patient, I needed access to care. They would hang up on me. I, people would cuss me out on the phone. Um, yeah, so I, if I showed up at offices, people would you know, tell me to leave the building. So whenever I showed up at this doctor's office and just said I, I was a new primary care patient, um, I was able to get in for a physical. I actually sat down in the room with the doctor and I came out to the doctor and said, I'm trans and I found your name on an informed consent providers list. Uh, I, I saw on there that you help people who are trans access care. And he said, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you saw that. Yeah, I can help you. You know, I, I put my name, on, my name on that list so people would be able to find me. And he said, I'll, I'll be back in just a minute. Um, so he left the room and he came back a few moments later um, and he got down on his knee in front of me and handed me some prayer pamphlets and said, I put my name on that list so you would find me and that through me you would find Jesus Christ and so that you would be saved and so we could exercise the demon out of you. Um, so I told him, you know, actually I'm I'm a theologian, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor to be one day and i I think we're reading different Bibles, but um, I ended up leaving. I went out to the parking lot and broke down into tears. And that really sums up a lot of my gender care access stories. Um, whenever I moved to the state of Kentucky, a, a few years after that, I, I had started on HRT. I had been on hormone therapy. Um, but whenever I actually, whenever I found a doctor who somebody in the community had recommended, whenever I was able to get in for some appointments, it took a while. They didn't really understand what blood work to check. They didn't understand why my hormone levels weren't doing what they thought they should be doing. Um, they increased my dosages of certain medications that actually caused a lot of problems. Um, I started having some chronic bladder problems and chronic bladder infections um, due to really high doses of a certain medication that they had me on. Um, and they just couldn't get my hormone levels to respond. It turns out, though, that I'm also intersex, and they didn't understand how to look for that or how to check for that or how to understand any of that. So uh, it wasn't until I was referred to an endocrinologist much later. I mean, they they just kind of... They, didn't think to refer me until a couple of years down the road, but after they referred me to an endocrinologist, um, they said, you know, let's, let's just try a different form of, you know, HRT and let's see if that has any kind of response. And even that endocrinologist, I had to ask for certain blood work to be done. Um, I had to ask for, I had to go over certain studies and certain proposals and certain things that they just didn't have any framework for. So it was still um, a, an experience where I often felt like I was having to, you know, do the education for anything about who I was or what I needed. Um, and today I, I have a primary care doctor who finally is for the first time and it's been almost 12 years of transition now. Um, the first time in 12 years or so, I have a primary care doctor that that started doing the blood work without me having to ask for it, um, without me having to explain why I needed it, without me having to argue for looking for certain things, um, checking my doses and getting my hormones and my, my endocrinological system, you know, being, being in a place where it should be. And um, that's had a pretty big impact on my life. It's, it's been almost 12 years of doctors not knowing how to, how to get the basics. Um, so I, I still struggle sometimes whenever I need to get referred for something. Um, am I going to walk into the office and be assaulted? Am I going to have somebody argue with me about something? Um, 
is there some is there something going to come up in my background that, that I've been I've had nurses yell at me and shout me out of an office before I've been physically assaulted in a doctor's office um, I've I've had a doctor an endocrinologist here in Kentucky who I had to see that um, he took me into the examination room and was doing a physical examination um, he had his hands inside of me and made a statement kind of asked me just I guess off the cuff he thought when when was the first time that I had a conscious thought of you know being a woman when did you when did you first start believing that you were a woman um, while he's doing an examination you know and, and it's the that that's even within like the last handful of years I mean these you never know. You don't know when you're going to walk into the office and have somebody, you know, argue with you about who you are or what what you need or what your care parameters might be. Or it's it's a minefield. Um, and and I I talking to other people in the trans community, there are just as many stories of folks who have been uh, abused, assaulted, uh, harassed, and denied denied access, denied care, especially people who, people of color or anybody who's facing any other access of marginalization, um, having, having any kind of other, you know, situation that whether it's, you know, medical or whether there's something, you know, economic or anything, it, it, those things really start to stack up pretty quickly and, and those stories become very, very heartbreakingly common. Um, so it's it I think it's a consistent hope in the community that just more education can be done like this that more opportunities can be presented for folks to just have a basic understanding of you know how how our community functions and what we need thank you Lily and thank you Alexander um, just for sharing that with us and trusting us enough to be vulnerable and, um, and sharing your stories. Um, Mike, if you would like to uh, start your presentation. Yeah, let me see if I can seamlessly uh, do this. Try and put this into presentation mode. Uh, did that work? I think I got the wrong one. Let me. Okay, are you all seeing the uh, the paradigm shifts? Yes, this, this okay, okay, and not not the presenter view. Uh, trying to get Zoom and Microsoft to work together is fun. Um, so this, you know, I, I'm assuming that with the folks that are here, that we don't necessarily need to be doing the the 101 ABCs of uh, the LGBTQ community. Although we're ab absolutely happy to answer any and all of those questions as um, as people want to. Um, what I wanted to talk about is kind of um, paradigm shifts around gender identity. And I started this as thinking about sort of social, you know, society-wide ones. And I thought, you know, it's, it's really easier and better for me to talk about my own experience. So uh, this will be kind of three different paradigms that I've had in my life and thinking about gender identity and how they have changed. And I think that for um, most folks um, on here, We'll probably have made the shift from the the first paradigm into the second paradigm, uh, and then what's what's interesting for me is I was working with LGBTQ uh, issues and people, and I, I went away for a few years and kind of came back, and I found as I educated myself coming back that there had been this big shift, and that was sort of from from the second to the third paradigm, and I think that's where sometimes people who are well intentioned uh, may still kind of make mistakes because they're seeing something a little bit differently. Um, and sometimes if you're in a different paradigm, it may be a very small wording difference, but it can really make a, a big profound difference. Um, so a couple of, uh, you know, just kind of caveats here. Um, as I said, this is based on my evolution of my personal understanding. You know, this is not meant to be a sweeping social study or universal consensus of, of how everyone sees the world. And I'm not trying to say that, 
you know, the way I see things now is better than anybody else or, or anything like that. Um, or to imply that, that this is everybody's understanding. Um, as we get to the third paradigm, I think you'll find that that's where younger people tend to be generally, uh, but that's certainly not always going to be the case. And, you know, if you've met one transgender person, you've met one transgender person. Their experience is different than everybody else's. Their perspective will be different than everybody else. Uh, so, you know, take all of this with a grain of salt. But I think as, as I walk through this kind of how my, my thinking has evolved, I hope that'll be helpful for people. So uh, my first paradigm I think of as kind of like the sex change paradigm. And for me, this was totally informed by TV and movies, you know, had never actually met anyone who was transgender. Um, and I, I got the headline here from Christine Jorgensen, a uh, very famous trans woman from the 50s. Um, and, you know, this was at this time we talked about, you know, somebody was trapped in a man's body and they got a sex change. And so the, the whole concept of gender and gender identity and, and trans issues at, in this paradigm is solely around a medical transition and around specifically it's seen as like an event. You know, somebody has an operation and they went into the operation as a man and now they're a woman or vice versa. Um, and it's just kind of a, a single event that happens. We would often talk about people and people would, would identify themselves as being pre-op or post-op, you know, they'd had or had not had this operation. Uh, generally, we'd talk about transsexual was the term that would be used. And it was sort of a loose identification with gay and lesbian community, but, you know, not, not really sure where that fit. And we were always thinking about this in terms of binary. You know, we were, this is male to female or fe female to male, with the idea being that the person, when they transitioned, they would be a very masculine man or a very feminine woman. You know, but there was there was very binary sort of uh, black and white, and then we would always assume that people were were passing. You know, they were going to pass as a woman after they transitioned, or pass as a man, um, and that that and it was sort of a don't ask, don't tell. You know, we were we weren't going to talk about it as as much as possible, and so that was that was the view I developed. You know, in the eighties and nineties, watching uh, you know night court episodes where somebody would come back and they had a sex change. And then I started to actually, you know, meet with and work with transgender people in the early 2000s, uh, 2004, 2005 through 2008, probably. And I began to, uh, my views began to evolve. And so I began to understand gender identity as part of this equation. So we would talk about sexual orientation, you know, are you gay, straight, bisexual, and then gender identity is this other component, you know, do you identify as a man or a woman, and understanding that your gender identity may not match your biological sex, and then that's when somebody is transgender. Um, and so as part of this, we start thinking of starting to understand the world, starting to understand this as surgery is no, no longer the central moment, it's one step of a larger process. So we're beginning to think of somebody transitioning and this is a journey that they're on rather than they fly off and this is, you know, a single surgery. Uh, and as part of that, we started using the word transgender more often than transsexual. And the focus becomes more on that social construct of gender rather than just biological sex. Uh, and this, again, this is a few years ago, you know, we would often talk about somebody as a biological male living as a woman or if somebody was a transgender male or a transgender female, you know, we would see that opposite as being biological or genetic. Um, we began talking about the LGBT community, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community, and really that being people who were, uh, whose sexual orientation or gender identity put them in a minority group. And we're still talking about people passing as male or female, but uh, generally beginning to be, you know, there are more allies, people are more open, being able to be open about being transgender. Um, but we still have this binary heteronormative perspective. Again, we're talking about people are usually transitioning from male to female or female to male, and there's not really a middle ground. And heteronormative meaning that we're really uh, expecting people to be in relationships and situations that mimic heterosexual male female relationships. So, you know, that was still kind of how I understood uh, trans issues um, a few years ago. And then I had this big paradigm shift where I began to understand 
uh, this third paradigm. And so, and I think of this as transition in, it's not transition so much as affirmation. And so this third paradigm is the person has always been a man. They've always been a woman. They are coming out as a transgender man or woman, and they are transitioning to affirm that. So this is, and I really want to, it took me a minute to get my head around this. It's not, you know, so and so, this person was born male and they're going to go have an operation and now they're a female. They have always been a trans woman and they are now going to take steps or not take steps to affirm that and transition. And so uh, I, I use this photo here of uh, the Elliot Page time cover. Um, if people remember when Elliot Page came out in 2020, it was really exemplary of this new model where the headline was, Elliot Page announces he is a transgender man. And then if you read in there, you would see a reference to Elliot Page, you know, and then they would, in parentheses, formerly known as Ellen Page, and they would talk about his career before he transitioned. Um, and I think that's really exemplary of that, where the headline was not Ellen Page announces that she is going to transition. The headline is Elliot Page is a transgender man. And to me, that that's a, it's a, like I say, it's a small shift in words, but it's a fundamental shift in thinking about this. And so, um, as I as I say here, you know, your the current name and pronouns are used when speaking of pre-transition life. So Elliot Page, for example, we would talk about Elliot Page. He was in this movie before he transitioned. Um, or Caitlyn Jenner, she won a gold medal before she transitioned. Um, instead of saying someone was born male, we say she was assigned male at birth uh, and is a trans woman. Um, the other big piece of this is that we begin to understand, or I begin to understand that medical status has no bearing in identity. You have medical transition, you have legal transition, you have social transition. Someone may or may not choose to go on hormones. They may or may not choose to have surgery. And that doesn't mean they are any more or less of a man or a woman. Uh, we affirm and respect them as being their, being who they are regardless of whether or not they've transitioned, whether or not they've had a medical transition. And the nature of their medical transition is nobody's business. You know, un unless you are their doctor, you really have no business knowing whether or not someone is or is not medically transitioning. Um, and of course, most people I think are uh, up on this where we now talk about uh, someone being cisgender if they're not transgender. And if you're not familiar with that term, it just simply means, you know, a transgender person is someone whose uh, gender identity does gender identity does not match their biological sex. And a cisgender person is someone whose biological sex does match their gender identity. So before we might say, you know, someone wasn't a transsexual woman, they were a real woman, or they were a biological woman. Now we would say that someone is a cisgender woman. So it's a much more value neutral way of talking about that. Um, and then we don't wanna use somebody's dead name. We don't wanna use their previous pronouns. Uh, if, if pronouns are really kind of a key way of being respectful and of showing that you are respectful and that you're willing to be an ally and listen. So you wanna ask for people's pronouns, share your own uh, and be sure to respect them when someone does say, you know, please use he, him or she, her. One of the other things about this paradigm that people may be encountering that can be a little bit jarring is that for a lot of trans people now, there's a rejection of this idea that cisgender people are the authority on what it means to be a man or a woman. And so we begin to see people being non-binary, gender fluid, gender non-conforming. And you hear people saying, I'm trans masculine or I'm trans feminine, but not necessarily a trans man or a trans woman. So it used to be we had this idea that, okay, if you're a man and you're, you know, you're trans and you're going to become a woman and it's this black and white binary thing. Now there's this really understanding of this broad spectrum and somebody may express their identity, they express their gender identity in any number of ways and that they don't, uh, people will often say, I don't owe you masculinity. I don't owe you femininity. Um, they don't ascribe to the idea that if I'm a trans woman, I need to adhere to 
a very specific way of being a woman so that I can make you more comfortable. Um, a lot of people, of course, who are trans women are very, you know, traditionally feminine, but you have a lot more people who are saying, no, I'm don't, I'm going to be my own kind of woman. Um, and with that, that's that challenging heteronormative assumptions and, and traditional gender roles, a lot more people being having these non-binary identities. Um, and again, it's sort of the idea that you have to pass is challenged. And in, in many cases, just even rejected as a concept that I don't have to pass as a man. I don't have to pass as a woman. I am a man. I am a woman. Um, and then, of course, part of this, too, that being trans is not something to be ashamed of or an affliction. It is something that people are proud of and are happy to have be part of them. Um, and I know there's a lot to, to go through here. Um, I do want to just, you know, as I said before, that's not saying that everyone, you know, every person nowadays, every young person is not in this third paradigm, uh, but it's a lot more common. And I think if you're, if you're in that second paradigm, and you're trying to talk to somebody who's in that third paradigm, it can really kind of create some confusion, or you might use a word that you think is fine that somebody else might not, uh, they may interpret it differently. Um, and that's why I say, you know, a small change in wording, the difference between somebody being born male or assigned male at birth, it's virtually the same words, but it represents a profound change in philosophy. And the language will continue to evolve and change. And what I'm saying now, somebody probably somewhere else already thinks is obsolete. Uh, and as long as we speak with respect and listen with intent and treat people with dignity, I think that's, that's the main thing. Uh, so that's kind of my spiel there and I'll shut up now. Thank you, Mike, um, just for being able to walk us through that. Um, and teaching us about how to have some conversations and how we can be better advocates for our trans Kentucky, just the people in our community. It's, um, it's something that I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with, even people who are, you know, who are like-minded. Um, I, I just, I think this was, this was very important. Um, we are ready to move into the Q and A portion. Um, so if anyone has any questions for the panelists, um, you can type them into the chat box. Um, I don't think that we have any right now. So if anybody wants to say anything else, um, I know that Alexander, you went first. So if, if anything that anybody else heard or that anybody else said brought up another point for you, same thing, Lily, Karen, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, sorry, Senator Byrd, um, just go ahead. I don't mind jumping. I, I just kind of wanted to um, piggyback off of some things that Mike was saying and kind of maybe further elaborate for some people and explain why, because it can be it can be exhausting to kind of keep up with the changing language and, and things like that. And I just kind of wanted to speak to some of that for a second, if I could. Um, so there are two parts of that, right? So the first part of like all of these seemingly changing identities comes from individuals not finding an identity that they feel fits them and coming up with a term that, that they can call themselves that feels authentic to them. And then other people go, oh, that fits better than what I'm calling myself right now. And that that's one way that language evolves. On the other side of that coin, because some of these dated terms like transsexual and trans in a, a lot of even dated, more dated terms like transvestite, a lot of our elders actually fought for those words. And I think it's important to speak to that. And the reason that that language changes is because, and this is kind of piggybacking off of what Mike was saying and treating people with respect and treating people with dignity, the, those, that language changes because those words turn into slurs, right? So if we, kind of use these words with intention, they might stop changing, you know what I mean? Um, but it's also in that same breath important to honor 
where we come from in those words, because like I said, like our elders did fight for those words because they were called even worse things than those. Um, so I just thought it was important to, to kind of mention that. Yeah, I can also add a little bit as well um, that, I, I, so I, I know these were paradigm shifts for like specifically where you're at, Mike, <laughs> like these are paradigms that you've been through, but also uh, there's a little bit of like almost a fourth paradigm shift going on now too. Um, and it's, it's a little bit more that we've had this like stark differentiation between gender as something that's socially constructed and sex that's something that is determined by biology. Um, and really the, the, a lot of the shift now seems to be more that there's, there's things about gender that are, are innate, right? There's, you can't put somebody through therapy to change their gender. It just doesn't work. You can't hypnotize somebody into having a different gender. You can't trick somebody. You can't raise somebody as a, a different gender. And then they just somehow fit right into it and everything's fine. Um, there's been lots of different studies on this. There's been lots of different case studies. So we know that there's something immutable about gender that needs to be expressed and that expresses itself. And at the same time, we also know there's a lot of social construction around it, right? There's certain gender roles and expectations that people have that, like Mike mentioned, fit into this heteronormative perspective and are enforced on people, right? And oftentimes when we take away that oppression and enforcement, we start to see a lot more, you know, better outcomes for folks, healthier living, healthier, uh, just better mental health, uh, more, you know, a more bountiful life. So gender, we've got a little bit of like innateness and we've got also some social construction. We're starting to kind of see in a lot of studies and a lot of research that there's something probably pretty similar going on with sex. Whereas we previously thought that sex was something that was very deterministic and something that was set in stone. There's also seemingly some social construction going on around sex as well. Like I'm like I mentioned earlier, I'm intersex. So I do identify as trans because I don't fully identify with how I was assigned at birth, but I'm also intersex and there are other things going on there as well. So there are certain things about sex that change over time, whether it's hormones or whether it's, you know, secondary sex characteristics or uh, whether it's your uh, external genitalia or whatever your, you know, what your gonads are doing. Um, and there's, I mean, there's also people who uh, they have certain hormones in their system, but they don't have the receptor sites for certain hormones in their system. So like, it, you, you, it's very difficult to really point to one or two things and say, this determines someone's sex and this makes things very clear. It's actually quite complicated. And, you know, I mean, many things in medicine are very complicated and, and having a fifth grade textbook explain different concepts is not always the most helpful way to approach patients or to approach science or to approach whatever it might be. So it, it makes sense then that there's also what does sex mean? That's something that's socially constructed, right? So we, how do we define these things and categorize these things and how do these categories shift over time? And, you know, how does this happen, not just in humans, but also in, you know, other species that we see around us? There's lots of complicated factors. And so that's, that's contributing to an, another bit of a paradigm shift as well, where people are starting to question how heteronormativity has also impacted how we talk about sex. Um, so, so ultimately, I mean, I think, you know, to, to Alex's point as well, um, language is really important. And, and to Mike's point too, that a, a change in language, it might seem very small, but it really can identify where someone is at you know, or what decades of somebody's perspective is informed by. Um, and sometimes that, that can be very helpful to know. And sometimes it can be something that can put up barriers and sometimes it can prevent people from accessing what they need. Um, so, so language is important, but also we, we don't necessarily wanna let that language dictate the experience that we're having with someone else, right? To be open and to, to be willing to reflect some of that language that maybe they're giving to us that we might not understand um, and be open to that experience in those conversations. So 
Senator Berg, did you have a comment? You unmuted a minute ago. I wanted ago. to jump in um, real quickly as a practicing physician in the state of Kentucky and honestly apologize to two of the panelists who clearly have had really bad experiences with healthcare providers in this state. Um, I cannot make excuses for that. I can, I can say that as a mother of a trans child, I am aware that there has been an absence of knowledgeable providers in this state. I will also tell you as a general rule of thumb, um, for people who are looking for quality healthcare providers in this situation, like Lily said, I would start with an endocrinologist. And I would start with an endocrinologist at a major university facility. That is my advice for parents or you know, people who are looking for themselves. If, 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 I'm going, if I'm going to begin this journey, where do I begin in the state of Kentucky? And that is where I would start. I'm not going to promise you that you're going to get the best quality there, but you're at least going to get people who should have some knowledge of what they're doing and, and, and what the options are for you. And then let that person, God willing, pick a primary care provider for you. Because the endocrinologists are the ones who should be, should have the most access the trans community and and who are good knowledgeable caring providers to offer for them and i just want to say you know as a physician here in this state both of you um i find it a deep shame that you have gone through the difficulties with providers that you've gone through um and i just wanted to share that Thank you for that, Senator Berg. Um, I did want to, we had a question submitted beforehand, um, just asking about uh, what gender affirming care can look like across different age points. So there's some been significant misinformation over the past year and some, um, some fear mongering about um, you know, medically transitioning or surgically transitioning kids. And that's I know that that's not true, but I, I know that you all have expertise beyond what I have. So if any of you want to speak to that. I'm going to jump in for a second um, because this is something that's being litigated all over the country right now and legislated all over the country right now. <clears throat> and I don't think that the majority of people in this country have an idea of what we're talking about. When we're talking about minor children, minor children who know that they are trans, we have the opportunity, we have the ability to actually stop that child if they are aware and confident and the family is comfortable young enough to actually stop that child from going through the puberty of their assigned gender. We use a drug called Lupron for that. It is a drug that is used for many other purposes as well. Um, I mean, it is a medically acknowledged safe drug. The advantage of that, if you have that knowledge, and you have that ability, is that you can actually block the, the um, manifestations of section, secondary sexual characteristics that happen during puberty. And after puberty, as that person gets older, they can go through the puberty of essentially their chosen gender. And in my opinion, if you have a family that has the knowledge, that has the wherewithal, basically you are saving that child years and years of, of Difficulty. I don't know what the what the better word is. Um, years and years of dysphoria, of of suicidality, of depression, of feeling like you don't belong. That you look in the mirror and what you see and who you are are totally different things. That is, in my opinion, medically indicated, medically indicated and medically appropriate. We do nothing else 
for minor children with gender dysphoria or transgender. You can, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old with the parents' um, permission, consider things like top surgery, which I would not be opposed to in a minor child. I think by 16, 17, 18 years old, you are old enough. But there is no, you know, there's this, this thought process that we're taking young children and doing, doing genital mutilation on them. That is not happening anywhere in the United States of America. And, and for us to have to have legislation to protect these children from quote unquote abuse is literally disgusting in my opinion. So I'm gonna stop there. I just wanna follow up after that and highlight the paradigm, the paradox rather of, um, I, I heard you mention that there are no gender surgeries being performed on minor children. And to speak to, I don't want to speak for Lily, but on behalf of the intersex population, there are gender surgeries being performed on not, on, not children, but infants that are days old, making decisions for them. Yeah. And that another thing that I kind of felt important to speak to is that to kind of speak to some of the fear of some of these parents that are saying, I don't, I, I don't know about prolonging um, the effects of puberty, like what will that happen? And I think an important thing to, that, to mention is that those effects are reversible. Like it, changing your mind is really far few and far between. Um, but on the rare occasion that that does happen to your child, stopping puberty blockers will just let them go through puberty naturally with no effects. And I think that's important to mention as well. Yeah. yeah I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to, to kind of to Alex, as he was saying that, you know, there's, there's virtually no risk because the number of people who detransition or stop transitioning is is small and generally it's because of social pressures you know it's this world is too difficult um you know it, it's almost infinitesimal numbers of people who transition or or begin to transition and say oh you know what i was wrong i'm not trans i'm cis um that's very 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 rare yeah it's something like one to two percent which you know i think it's i mean it's important that folks that are making those decisions also still you know get support and be able to have support and be taken care of and get what they need as well but i mean if you're talking medical treatments that have a one to two percent regret rate or a one, one to two percent rate of not being successful that's pretty that's pretty amazing that means it's a 98 to 99 percent success rate of of people who are very satisfied with those outcomes or, or quite satisfied with those outcomes and that's pretty astounding for any any kind of treatment right so you know, especially with kids, um, access to this care, you know, being being old enough to make these decisions, you know, a lot of these kids are old enough to make the decision to take their own lives, you know, to, to end their lives. Um, the, a, a lot of folks are probably familiar with the 40% number that gets thrown around that um, about 40% of the trans community, uh, people have um, attempted suicide at some point. Uh, and, and that oftentimes even gets thrown around and used to, to abuse trans people and used to harass trans people. Um, but the studies that have been done on that show that consistently, whenever you give people just two things, when you give people access to medical care, qualified medical care, and when you give them a supportive social network, that number drops down and mirrors, almost mirrors general population numbers for attempt rates. And that's absolutely mind blowing. I mean, this is something that has an attempt rate that is worse than any other chronic medical condition combined. If you think about like the worst medical outcomes and diagnoses that you can that you can pass on to somebody, the most the, the most painful cancers, the most painful nerve diseases, the most painful degenerative, you know, whatever conditions that you might hand to somebody, this has an attempt rate higher than all of those things combined. And it's something that is very prevalent. Uh, you know, it's uh, 
numbers can be anywhere between one and 200, one and 150, one and 100, depending on if you're including folks who are intersex. You know, it, it's really not that uncommon. And, and that is a staggeringly high attempt rate for such a broad community that really only needs two things, just access to care and people to say that you are loved and you are valuable and that you are, your life is meaningful. Um, and that can make a huge difference to people. So, you know, wh whether it's somebody who's a teenager or not, I mean, I know personally for me, having access to, to puberty blockers, whenever I first came out, uh, you know, in 2000 and 2004, 2005, whenever I first came out in, in early high school, I, I asked to see an endocrinologist and I didn't have access to that. And there are a lot of folks, there are a lot of kids who their parents refuse to take them or refuse to give them access to that treatment or economically or, you know, what, whatever barriers might be in place, they just can't go and see those people who have that, act, you know, that, that ability to give that care and that informed, you know, perspective. So there are a lot of folks who struggle for a long time. If I had had access to puberty blockers, it would have been absolutely a, a game changer. My life would have been so different. Um, and it would have saved so much grief and trauma and pain. Um, so, and I, I know that's true for pretty much any, you know, anybody in the community. If, if we had been given a chance to have some sense of autonomy, some sense of, you know, participation, some ability to be informed, that would have, that makes a huge difference for people and it saves lives. It, it just even providing support for the community actively saves lives. Thank you all so much for being here today and for sharing your expertise, your experience, uh, and just your perspectives. Um, we are about to wrap up here. There's one more question in the chat box if anyone wants to address that. Um, it is about um, accessibility or uh, other specific health needs within the trans community um, from the perspective of um, a community health worker working on HIV services. Um, I just got word that we actually do have a minute here. So if anybody wants to verbally respond to that um, quickly, uh, I'm happy to let's let's do that now and then we can close up. I, I can I speak that and then someone some else may want to as well, but I know access and it's it's capacity. We need more providers who are willing to do the work to be trans affirming providers. Um, it's, you know, it is specialist in a certain way. I'm probably using the wrong term, but um, you know, it's also not, uh, it's, it's something that any provider can do. Any provider can become trans affirming. And so we need more providers to step up and do that um, and begin that process. Just wanted to like, also mentioned that if you want to get hooked up with like the pride center there are a lot of affirming therapists that have been having conversations about trying to get ceus for folks like working with different um universities around town um to help people get like affirming training um so that might be a reason to kind of get connected to the pride center with mike i would say uh, the the vast majority of the barriers that we see are something that are informed by the social bias and stigmas and, and just the oppressive, uh, the, the same things we see. I mean, a lot of this legislation coming out, it's, it's not something that's informed by research or by science. It's something that's obviously informed by social biases and, and discrimination. So, I mean, similarly, the, the problems with access to care and some of the, some of the worst things that we see in the community I mean, you see that stacked on top of other, like I said, other marginalized, situ you know, identities, pe people who are, you know, facing other social stigmas, that just keeps compounding. And so, so addressing that, I think, first and foremost, is something that is going to lead to much better outcomes for m way more people. Um, so, so just looking at those biases and deconstructing that stuff and have building proximity with the community and, and getting to know folks and getting to know some of those specific struggles and some of the things that, that you know, the community is asking for. I mean, just 
there's we'll tell you what we need. <laughs> we just need people who are willing to listen and willing to, to step into that work. Thank you all again for joining us today. If you have any questions um, or ideas that you want to see addressed in a future Health for a Change training, reach out to us via email. The contact information for our communications team is on your screen now, and be sure to follow us on social media if you aren't already. We will send the link for the on-demand video uh, from today, so feel free to share that with your networks, and have a great rest of your day.